Right, if I could introduce our moderator for tonight, the vice chairman of our board, and a great Marine, former commander in chief of the U.S. Central Command, General Joe Hoare. General Hoare. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Robert Kaplan. The, the real truth is, in order to overcome these vast impersonal forces, you first have to recognize what they are and recognize how formidable they are, because only by respecting them can you overcome them. And that's what this book is about. Let's take Tunisia, where the Arab Spring began in late December of 2010. It began in a town called Sidi Bouzid by a fruit and vegetable bender who set himself on fire to protest his poor economic circumstances. Let's take a step back. Tunisia is the country in the Arab world closest to Europe. It's, it's like a promontory sticking out, almost touching Sicily. It's only eight hours by slow ferry from Tunis to Trapani in Sicily. It's, uh, it, for centuries, for most of history in other words, it was integrally related to what was, we now think of as Italian history. Only in the last century has it become separate. In fact, I can tell you that the border, the southern border of Europe is not the Mediterranean. It's the Sahara Desert. Because most North African Arabs don't live in the desert. They live along the Mediterranean coast. If you look at a demographic map of Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, everyone's clustered near the coast. And they're actually part of Europe and will become much, mo much more, in fact, part of Europe uh, now that authoritarian regimes have been toppled and the slow, circuitous march towards more modern societies develops. Americans think they're exceptional. Uh, they think they're better than other people. Americans happen to live in the last resource-rich swath of the temperate zone that was settled by Europeans at the time of the Enlightenment, that has more mileage of inland waterways than the rest of the world combined, and that these waterways flow conveniently north, uh, southeast, northwest, northwest, southeast, thus uniting the continent. Uh, America has oceans on each side. To the north is the Canadian Arctic. Just north of the border is a, is a tenth of the population of the United States, all middle class, all living within 100 miles of the US border. Uh, America's only real geographical challenge is to the south with Mexico. And I'll get to that later in the talk. But geography, we're, we're an exceptional people, not just because of who we are, but where we happen to live. And now, now let me go around the world a bit and, and explain this further. Europe. Europe has been reduced to a financial story, where whenever you read a story about Europe, it's about debt replacements, interest rates, loan, you, you know, forgiving loans. If you don't have a PhD in economics, you can't follow what's going on in Europe. But in fact, Europe, the European story is much larger than that. It's a geopolitical story. It's a geographical story. Look at the map of the European Union. Where are the cities located, the great cities of the European Union? The capital, Brussels, the treaty town of Maastricht, the parliament town of Strasbourg, uh, et cetera. They all lie along. This, the line of the spinal column of old world civilization that is completely synonymous with Charlemagne's empire in the ninth century. And this is no accident that the European Union, it's, it, you know, where the decisions are made, are exactly the heart of Charlemagne's empire. Because this is the rich forest land with forest clearings conveniently located where cities could take root. In fact, so, so important is geography, let me tell you, that when the Warsaw Pact collapsed in 1990 or thereabouts, and if you looked at a map, 
you could predict how each former Warsaw Pact country would do economically over the next decade, under the first decade of independence from the Soviet Union, merely by its cartographic position. Uh, Poland, uh, part of the Prussian Empire, uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic all did the best, all those countries in the north. Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, and, and, the, and the central and southern parts of the former Yugoslavia, all parts of the former Ottoman Turkish Empire, either fell into political paralysis like Romania, into, into periodic anarchy like Bulgaria and Albania, or into outright war like two-thirds of the former Yugoslavia. The two countries of the former Yugoslavia that have done the best in the last decade, both economically, socially, in terms of uh, quality of life, Slovenia and Croatia were both part of Habsburg Austria, in which in turn was a creature of geography. So that while we're all reading about a financial crisis, geopolitics is not ended. Because while Europe is now enwrapped in its own problems, the specter of Russia to the east looms. The Warsaw Pact may have collapsed, but Russia is still a force to reckon with to the east. Russia supplies Central and Eastern Europe with natural gas, giving it a lot of leverage. And that natural gas also puts a lot of money into the hands of Russia, over a billion dollars, uh, over uh, several hundred billion dollars to spend, almost a trillion dollars actually, in, in, in save revenues. And this natural gas is a creature of geography in central and eastern Siberia. And so while the European Union wallows in its troubles, the Russians are buying up everything from electricity grids to gas trans natural gas transport groups uh, to other infrastructure throughout Central and Eastern Europe. Not creating the Warsaw Pact, but creating a new zone of influence. Europe has less financial bandwidth to, to aid countries like Serbia and the Ukraine, uh, which, which, is perfect, perfect, which is very convenient for Russia. Ukraine is, uh, is mired in political paralysis, corruption, instability in the countryside. The Russians love this situation. Um, so that, so that the battle between Russia, and by the way, throughout all this, Germany has gotten much stronger. Ger Berlin may not have all the answers, but Berlin is sort of the point of arbitration for all these issues uh, in dealing with the EU debt crisis. Uh, NATO and the EU were supposed to keep the Germans down and the Russians out. It's done neither. Uh, we, we've come back to classical geographically based geopolitics with the Russians surging forward, Europe weak, and that band of, of buffer states from Estonia to, um, to Bulgaria up for grabs in a sense. Let me move on to China for a moment or two. China has two big geographical facts, one positive, one negative. The positive geographical fact of China is that China is much bigger than it looks on the map. Uh, China is set to, a, a, to, to, uh, to uh, is set to expand, not through troop movements, but virtually through corporate takeovers, migration, and others into the Russian Far East, into former Soviet Central Asia into Southeast Asia. Uh, the Russian Far East only has 7 million people and the population is going down to 4.5 million people. Uh, to contrast that with 100 million Chinese in Manchuria. Uh, the Russian Far East has the timber, diamonds, and gold that China covets. China is, is, you know, is poised to expand into Outer Mongolia, which had been part of China under the Qing Dynasty 200 years ago. China again, uh, Mongolia again, has, has a lot of the minerals, strategic metals, the, the grasslands, 
all of which China covets. And Mongolia has only two million people, while there are hundreds of millions of Chinese poised at the border. Central Asia, the Chinese are building oil pipelines, natural gas pipelines, flooding the area with goods and loans, uh, basically stealing Central Asia from Putin. And just a word about Tibet. The Dalai Lama is a geopolitical, geographical figure. Uh, he's kind of like Pope John Paul II, uh, who is Polish, who therefore affected European po geopolitics. The Dalai Lama sits on the land, Tibet, which has all the water resources, not just for China, but for Bangladesh and Northeast India as well. It's like the water capital of the world. First of all, Israel is a small country surrounded by enemies half a world away. The United States is a big country mainly surrounded by friends and open seas. Our geographical situations are so vastly different that our interests cannot overlap completely in every single situation. They overlap substantially for two reasons. One, Israel is a democracy and has a stable government. The other is that the US has supported Israel so vigorously and for so many decades that were Israel to be fundamentally threatened, it would probably undermine America's own reputation for power. The, Vietnam's rebuilding Cameron Bay, dredging it, because they want more US warships. They, uh, they whisper sweet nothings into the ears of American um, officials. Uh, they want more American air fighter jets at Tansanut Airfield. This is what they want. It, it, as someone explained to me, it's not because they love America. It's because they, they need America to balance against China.